percent. So good afternoon or morning or evening, uh, whatever it is where you are. Um, thank you for coming. So hello everyone and thanks for coming to this webinar session. It's brought to you by Belta with the support of Heike Philp of Let's Talk Online. Uh, my name is Nikia. I am the co-president of Delta, the Belgian English Language Teachers Association. And uh, it is Belta's aim to encourage professional development through bringing English language professionals in Belgium together to discuss the things that matter to me. We also want to connect Belgian teachers to the wider world of ELT, and that's why we offer this webinar series, where we bring our members together with teachers from around the world to watch presentations from international speakers. So hello to all the members that are here today and all those of you who are joining us from around the world. I hope that the turnout will increase a little bit during the um, webinar as it very often does. Before I introduce this month's speaker uh, to you, Johan, I would like to remind uh, all the Belgian members, Belgian professionals and other professionals that the annual Belgian Day will be held on the 22nd of March, which is just in two weeks' time, in Brussels. Um, you can still join us, and if you want more information about that, please check out the Belgian website. You can see it in the box on the right. Um, all the information is there, the program, the speakers, how to enroll, all the practical details are there. We have a great lineup of speakers and we hope, uh, of course, you can join us. In this month's webinar, we are joined by Johan Strobe, who will talk about using Corpora in the English classroom. And a very, very special welcome to Johan, as he is actually the first Delta member, apart from a board member who gave a webinar before, that was Vicky, but he is the first Delta member and also the first Belgian um, to be giving a webinar for us today. So very, very special welcome already. Thank you very much, Johan, for agreeing um, to give a webinar for us. Johan has been teaching English as a foreign language for over 30 years. He is a member of staff of the teacher training department of the University of Leuven. And his interests are the teaching of grammar and extensive reading and its effects on language acquisition. He is the editor and co-author of Enter, um, a series of EFL textbooks uh, published by Plum Den, a Belgian uh, publisher. Um, and his series integrates the use of teenage fiction in language learning. Johan is also a lecturer in English for Business and Law at the University of Leuven, and we are really pleased that he is with us today to share his expertise with us. Um, if, like I said, during the presentation you have any questions for him, please type them in the Q&A box under the slides. So Johan, it's over to you now. Thank you, Mika. Thank you for this uh, nice introduction. Uh, now, as you can see, uh, welcome to uh, everybody to uh, this webinar. I'm actually delighted to uh, be able to give it. As you can see, it's about corpora in the English classroom. Now, um, I have been using corpora for about four or five years now, and they've actually changed my way of teaching and my way of planning lessons and especially my way of uh, correcting and revising student uh, And I'm actually thrilled uh, to share some of my ideas with you. That I can encourage you to actually use corpora and uh, explore them, whichever corpora is available to you. Now, uh, I should probably click myself to uh, proceed in the uh, presentation. Yeah. So these are the questions I would like to address today. Uh, it's probably a bit overambitious to uh, address all of these questions, but I do my very best to answer them. The first question is, what is a corpus? And how and why should we use them? What can we, teachers of English, learn from a corpus? Which corpora are interesting for us teachers, and how can we actually use corpora in a classroom? And there I will give two or three ideas. I could give a lot more, but I'm afraid we don't have time to cover all of uh, these. Now, Macmillan Dictionary actually gives two definitions of a corpus. 
uh, a first definition is it's a collection of writing, for example, all the writings of one person. But of course, it's the second definition that interests us today. It's a collection of written and spoken language stored on a computer and used for language research and writing dictionaries. Now, I hope that you're not put off by this definition because it seems to suggest that uh, corpora are actually the sole domain of researchers and academics, but I believe that we teachers can use them uh, too. And this is what I'd like to uh, show today. Now, perhaps in the definition they could have included that it's a collection of language that has actually been used. And this is the interesting thing because corpora can bring in real language into our classroom, language as it is actually used. And we will see that sometimes the language that is used uh, differs from the prescriptive grammar and the prescriptive dictionaries. But as you can see in the definition in Macmillan, uh, dictionaries are now practically all corpus-based. And this is uh, what I took, for instance, from Longman Dictionary. Now, when I began teaching, uh, I used to say to my students, uh, there are many ways to translate veal, the Dutch veal. Mm? Translations are, for instance, a great deal, a plenty of, a great many, and much and many. And we used to say, uh, or I used to say anyway, uh, we use a lot of, plenty of, in affirmative sentences, and much and many in negatives and interrogatives. And this is not true, actually. And this is what you can see in Longman Dictionary. Um, there it says, the adverb much is mainly used before comparative adjectives. He's much older than she is. And the other examples are, Henry's room is much bigger than mine, much more comfortable, very much better. And as you can see, all these are actually affirmative sentences. The same holds for, for instance, words like foreigner. What we have learned from corpora is that the word foreigner can sound negative to native speakers. And in everyday English, people more often say people from other countries. So you see a lot of uh, the findings of uh, corpus research are now actually incorporated in dictionaries. I'm afraid to say not often in the textbooks that we use. Um, conditionals, that's another example. Uh, this is uh, one example I found in, I believe it's the Evening Standard, uh, two years ago, I believe. And there it says, it would be a cardinal sin if I screw this up. This is actually Sebastian, Lord Sebastian Co. I should say, saying this. And as you can see, this is to most textbooks, a wrong conditional. It starts as a conditional type two, it would be a cardinal sin, and according to the textbooks, it should be if I screwed this up. Now, I know that a lot of textbooks and grammars are too restrictive when it comes to conditionals. I used to tell my students, don't use word in the if clause. And uh, I was once with my students in London when we saw this, if you wouldn't eat your dog, why eat a turkey? And they, they told me, look, there you have wood in the if clause. And this is something I found in Michael Lewis, The Lexical Approach. And he says, and I believe he has a point, that exercises on conditionals have no point in the language classroom, for they set out to practice language which has simply been misanalyzed in the first case. Now, what he means with misanalyzed is that, that it doesn't reflect the linguistic reality. Another example, something we have learned from uh, corpora, is that going to, going to go, uh, is actually quite common. Um, and I used to tell my students, we don't say that, going to go, it doesn't sound good. But in actual fact, as you can see, if you use, for instance, the corpus, as you can see, the corpus of contemporary American English, you find a lot of examples. 
Gonago is another uh, matter, and I know that a lot of teachers hate Gonago. Uh, but it, it's, it's actually the weak form, the weak pronunciation of going to go. Now, I looked it up again in Coca, but what I did now, uh, can you see my cursor, uh, is I used the chart tool. And this is another interesting thing about corpora. You can actually talk about register and teach about register in the classroom. So what we see here, I actually uh, inserted a picture of Lenny Kravitz for my older daughter, who's not watching today, even though she's an English teacher, but never mind. What you can do is actually uh, teach about register. And what we see with Gonna Go is that it is used in spoken English and that you find it in fiction but it's not used, or rarely used, it's not so common in newspapers and academic English. So you can actually, by going to a corpus, show your students that they should not use gonna go, or gonna, the weak form, in, in uh, an essay, for instance, in an academic essay. Right. Have you ever used a, a corpus? Now I'd like to see some answers, if that is uh, okay with you. Just type in, John says yes, 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 not yet. Not in class, no from Russia. Just learning how to use a little Right, but I believe, quite frankly, that you've all used a corpus because we actually distinguish between non-conventional corpora and the conventional ones. And by non-conventional corpora, we mean uh, lyric search sites, quotation banks, Google images. Google is actually a corpus because it fits the definition. It's a huge uh, database of language, right? But it's unfiltered and it's not one uh, for linguistic research. Um, what we're going to focus on today is the conventional corpora, of course. And you see one example there, the British National Corpus. Um, but one, one instance of a non-conventional corpus. Um, if I remember well, Mika said it in the introduction, but I, I am actually, I like teaching grammar and uh, I really do. And sometimes I introduce a grammar item uh, with a song. Now, what I used to do was go through my collection, my huge collection, I'm afraid, of CDs and records to find uh, a song with, for instance, a lot of uh, present continuous uh, examples and, and such. But what I do now is actually use iTunes as a corpus. So uh, a few weeks ago, I wanted to introduce used to to my students, so to talk about past habits. And I typed it in in that query box here, and then you get a number of hits that you can download or we actually used uh, YouTube to find the songs. And that only took me a couple of seconds. Um, that is actually using a non-conventional -convention, uh, corpus. Yes, YouTube would work too, as uh, Sue Anand says. Of course, YouTube is also a corpus, strictly speaking. So there's no need to use iTunes. Right, but um, let's use, um, yeah, start using a corpus. Uh, the British National Corpus, for instance. As you can see, it's a 100 million word collection of samples of written and spoken language from a range of sources designed to represent a wide cross section of current British English, both spoken and written. Now, I wasn't quite sure if I would be able to go online, so I actually uh, inserted everything into my PowerPoint. But let's give it a try, and perhaps you can do that after this session at home. Uh, you go to the uh, web address that you find there, and this, oh, 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 
if this is what you see, uh, that's the query box, and I typed in the word teacher. And then you click go, and this is what you get. Yes, indeed, as uh, Muran Nava says, the uh, interface is a lot better than uh, POCA, so you can use uh, POCA to go to the British National Corpus, indeed. Um, so this is what you get. It doesn't say much, does it? What you get is 50 random sentences, uh, all using the word teacher, and you get an idea of the uh, frequency. So it says here that uh, 8,750 uh, seven times the word teacher is found in the corpus. Now the frequency doesn't say much yet, but uh, ling it, it says a lot to linguists and researchers and based on this they actually make dictionaries and again I'm showing uh, Macmillan and this is really great uh, for us if we want to know which words our students should know and study and revise. Well, teacher is definitely one of them. It's, of course, a word that they will know. But as you can see, it's a three star word in Macmillan, which means it's a red word, it's printed in red, which means that it's very common. Now, 90% of the time, as it says here, speakers of English use just 7,500 words. And all these words are actually printed in red in Macmillan. Uh, and this is really interesting, uh, but there are other means to know which words are common in English and which are not, and uh, I'd like to show some of these right now. Uh, yeah, indeed, Macmillan is very good. They're all very good, actually. Uh, the, the English dictionaries, Longman, uh, Cambridge, Oxford University uh, dictionary, they're all very good. Now this, I believe, is a, an interesting question. How can we assess, determine the difficulty of a text? Now the difficulty of a text has little to do with grammatical structures. It's basically a matter of vocabulary. If, um, if a student understands, or a learner, or, or we, understands about 70% uh, of the vocabulary, we more or less understand the text. And this is something that we should bear in mind also when we make uh, word lists for our students. And now I'd like to show some examples. This is a text I wanted to teach uh, some time ago in my classes. It's a text about climate change. And my wife, who teaches in a secondary school, uh, said, I would like to use the same text uh, in my classes, but would it not be too difficult? And then we actually used the Oxford text checker. I don't know if you know it, but it's really very interesting. So it's the, um, it in, well, I, perhaps I'll explain when, with an example. But what you can do is enter the text here in this box you can enter in the box below, you can enter any words to be ignored, like names or abbreviations that you think are not really interesting or such. And then you simply uh, click uh, probably an enter button. And this is what I got. Um, all the words in black are actually words that belong to the Oxford 3000. In other words, uh, the more red words there are, the more difficult a text is. And if you want your students to study the more, let's say, basic vocabulary, they should know and study the words in, in black, and perhaps the red words like intergovernmental, uh, throwing, tundra, quadruple, are not the ones they should actually study, and that perhaps you can explain in a footnote or such. Well, this text, 90% uh, of the words were actually uh, included in the words uh, in Oxford 3000, which means that the text 
is rather difficult. Um, it's actually between um, upper, intermediate, and advanced. This is how it was ranked with the Oxford uh, text checker. Really uh, a useful tool if you want to decide on the words that uh, your students should know. The interesting thing here is that um, what we used to do, I believe, is rely on our intuition and say this is a, a common word and perhaps it wasn't. It's a word we knew and we thought it was very common but perhaps it wasn't. And vice versa, perhaps some words we didn't know which are actually quite common in English. And now with corpora we have an objective tool, an objective means to uh, decide which words we should include in the word list for our students to study. Right. Um, this is something I often use uh, with my students to know which words are frequent in a text. And the more common words are in a text, if they want to talk about the text, they should actually know these words. This, uh, I used a word cloud for the very same text I just showed to you. Uh, and you see, if you want to talk about global warming, you should of course know global warming, change, climate, report, fossil fuels, burning, scientists, and so on. So the larger a word is represented in the word cloud, the more common it is. And you can play with this. It's uh, really interesting. Based on the same text. Do you see the difference? Does anyone see the difference between the first word cloud and this one? So I'll come back to the first one and show you this one now. Yes, Teresa, this is a word It's really interesting. Yeah, the second one is indeed uh, alphabetical. Right, there are other tools you can use to uh, determine whether your students should know a word. This is not perfect, but it's, it's definitely usable. It's the English vocabulary profile. So if, for instance, you teach students at a A1, B2, uh, or at a B1 level, you can type in a word and see if it's a B1 word, if they should actually know it. So this is the English vocabulary profile tool. Uh, again, really interesting. I typed in, for instance, the word measure, which uh, was quite common in the text that I've just shown. And there you see that the verb to measure is a B2 word. Uh, it can, in, in other meanings, it's a C1 word. And for instance, a measure of something is a C2 word. And a measure in the meaning of an amount is a C2 word. So really, um, yeah, an interesting tool if you want to make word lists for your students. OK. Now this will uh, bring us to poker in a minute. This is really interesting, and again, very scientific and objective. This is word and phrase dot info. And again, you can type in uh, a whole text to find out which words are common and which are not. Now, the words printed in that, yeah, it's a bluish color, like will, this week, issue, there, yet, about, the, these are words that belong to the 500 most common words in English. Um, and then up to 3,000 words is in uh, green. And the yellow words are, say, the difficult ones, like deforestation and starkest and dwindling, alarming, dithering, uh, plumes, and so on. So if you teach B1 students, perhaps it's not really interesting uh, to include these words in, in, in the word list or words that your students have to study. Academic words are represented in red, 
And the interesting thing is, if you click on a word, you get the context, you get sample sentences, you see the register. So really, really an interesting tool. And this will take us to um, COCA in a minute. So one thing I wanted uh, already to establish was that um, corpora and using corpora and the tools based on corpora are really very interesting to learn about the frequency of words and how common they are. And the more common a word is, the, the, the more our students should know them, I believe. Right, good. Yeah, so if you click on a word, now this is hardly readable for me, but I clicked on a word. Which one is it? Can't read it, to be honest. Um, anyways, if you click on a word, you actually see sample sentences, and we call these concordance lines, and the word you clicked on is in the middle. And you can use this in the classroom, as I will show a bit later in today's presentation. And you also see where these uh, words came from. So again, uh, a usable tool in the classroom, absolutely. Coca. Um, this is really an interesting corpus because it's huge. So as you can see, it's 450 million words. It's up to date. And the author, Mark Davis, has promised that he will keep it updated. So now it, it stops in 2012, while the British National Corpus stops in uh, 1993. So um, COCA is a lot more up to date. It has some very powerful tools. And it also includes other corpora, like the British National Corpus, or you can consult Time magazine, uh, and it also covers different registers, as we will see uh, in a minute. Yeah, this is the uh, yeah, this is what I wanted to. Um, I didn't think I'd I'd have time to explain the syntax of Coca, uh, but uh, that would definitely take another hour to explain. But there is a guy who's a lot better teacher than I am, and you probably know him. This is Scott Thornbury. And you know that he, uh, he has developed a sort of uh, A to Z of ELT. And with the C, he actually explains COCA. So C is for corpus. Um, he also included a, a clip in which he explains all about the syntax of COCA. And it's really very uh, well explained. It's very clear. It is something that you actually have to do on a regular basis, because if you do it only once, um, you forget. It's the same with uh, a lot of things, as, as you know. Okay. So COCA, go to uh, A to Z of ELT, and Scott Thornbury will explain everything about uh, the syntax, we call it, and how to use uh, uh, the corpus. Uh, Teresa says, it's a lifesaver for me and my students. Indeed, when it comes to cross-checking meaning, use, register, and so on of words, to be honest, personally, I use uh, corpora a lot more now than I use uh, regular dictionaries. Because very often, the, the, the regular dictionaries do not give me the answer to explain, for instance, about differences uh, between uh, synonyms or near synonyms, like almost and nearly and, and horrible and terrible. They're not really synonyms. And you can find this, uh, find perfect examples in, in a corpus and not in a, a, a regular dictionary. Right, so uh, COCA, 450 million words, and this is really, really 
huge and it's a very powerful tool indeed. When you go to the website, this is what you see. So it's the Corpus of Contemporary American English. But you can also uh, consult the British National Corpus through uh, COCA. And the interface is a lot more user friendly, I believe. So this is what you see. And another great thing is that it's absolutely free still. So all you have to do is register because if you don't, you actually have uh, only a limited access to uh, the corpus. This is what you see after you've registered. Um, you actually see three areas. This is the search area. This is where you will see some of the results. And this is where you see, so this area at the bottom right, where you see the concordance lines. Um, if you do not find the explanation by Scott Thornbury, uh, COCA also has a very useful help function. Uh, where should I start? And you get explanations for beginners and non-linguists. Uh, you get explanations, a help for people who've already used other corpora, and the se section here is uh, have used other corpora from the uh, COCA corpus. It's a very useful help uh, function. So where do I start? You can get a brief tour, a brief tour for non-linguists, uh, you get an overview, spoken transcripts, and so on and so forth. Right, this is the uh, search area, let's say. And as you can see, there are three, uh, four rather, things you can click. You can get a list of words, you can get a chart. You probably remember that this is what I did with uh, Gonna Go. Um, you can also find the word, this is I think keyword in context. There you see context. And you can also use a compare function which I will uh, show in, in a minute. You can ask for collocates. Uh, uh, this is a part of speech list. For instance, you can uh, uh, find out what is a preposition after different. Is it different from, different to, different than? And you can all define that if you use the right context. One button I often click is the reset button if things get stuck or like well, stuck. If I get stuck, basically, uh, I click reset and you can start again. You can ignore fiction, magazines, academic texts, and so on. Okay, um, very interesting. Now, what do I do with all this in the classroom? This is one example. Um, I think teachers in Belgium. Uh, more in particular, have a bad habit of starting a class by filling in a diary. And this, I find this absolutely horrible, especially if you start um, a grammar lesson. I, I've seen it a thousand times before uh, from my uh, train, teacher, trainee teachers. They start a lesson and say, take your diaries and fill in revision of the tenses. Ah, this is not very motivating, is it? Uh, now, one way of introducing a topic is what you can see in uh, the slide here. I left out a word. So what I did is uh, I took the left uh, column, I took the right one, and I did not copy, paste the word here, the missing word. Does anybody see what the missing word is? The missing word. It's not test, but you're very close. It's exam indeed. Exam, right. So it's a way of introducing uh, the topic of today's class rather than actually saying, today we are going to talk about. Another activity that I sometimes do is this, a memory game. Uh, so these are the sample sentences I took 
from uh, Coca. Uh, I typed in exam, it's, it's just an uh, example. And then I ask my, uh, I print out the results, the search results, and I ask my students to uh, go through them and write down collocations. And we all know how important collocations are when learning a language. And I, 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 I invite them to find as many good ones as possible with exam as a noun. Uh, and you see medical exam, psychosexual exam, entrance exam, to take an exam, the state exam, final exam, an eye exam, a skin exam, uh, things like that. Um, then we discuss them. I write them on the board. Then I ask uh, my students to hand in the uh, papers with the search results. I wipe out the, the, the collocations on the board and I ask them to write down as many collocations as they can from memory, a memory game. It's a game and it's an interesting one and it teaches them all about collocations. It's just one activity, but you can do a lot more. And I'm afraid, uh, I'm not quite sure. I wanted to include more examples, to be honest, but I wasn't sure if um, this webinar would be the ideal uh, tool or place to include examples. Now, my students often confuse economic and economical. And I have found that corpora are an excellent tool to explain about the ick or ico uh, adjectives like historic and historical. But back to my students, they often use economical, to be honest, when they mean economic. Like they say things like an economical recession or the economical situation in that country. And what I did, now you have to know a bit of the syntax now, uh, but this, as you remember, is the search area in COCA. And we want to compare economic and economical. Um, we, we use the compare tool. Now what I did was, I want the nouns that follow, just one noun, that follow economic or economical. No words in front of them, so I didn't want full sentences. You can actually, as you can see, define that. The number of words before preceding the, uh, a word or the number of words following it. So I, what I wanted was the noun following economic or economical and we wanted to compare this. Um, and these are the results I got. So economic collocates, as we say, with growth, economic growth, that's the commonest collocation. So they are arranged as to uh, frequency. Economic development, economic crisis, policy, policies, conditions, and so on. And you see that Usually, we do not speak, that's word one. Uh, the column next to it is word two. And we see that we do not speak uh, of economical growth or economical development that does not occur in the corpus or economical crisis. That would sound very silly. What I did find was economical sanctions and economical recovery. Now, if you click on economical recovery, so if you click that number one here, you see that it does fit uh, because economical there means not costing a lot of money uh, or energy. That's an economical recovery. Um, so an economical method, the, the most economical way, uh, the economical alternative, economical choice, um, and as you can see, the word economical is a, le a lot less common than uh, economic. So this is a great way of um, yeah, asking your students to do a bit of small-scale 
action research. There's a lot to do uh, these days in Belgium and the Belgian curricula about research competences. And uh, I think that corpora are an excellent tool to develop uh, your research competences. But you see, this is all small scale. Uh, as Mika has told you, I work at a university, but I, I'm, I'm basically a teacher and I'm proud of it. So what I do is small scale research and uh, uh, corpora are an excellent tool to do that. This is actually, I'm afraid, my last slide. Um, I hope, I'm hoping I didn't uh, go through the uh, webinar too quickly. But now we do have some time to uh, answer your questions. To finish, why should we use corpora? Well, I think that one of the main reasons is not there in the slide. It's, I think, I'm convinced that corpora will become even more important in teaching and in language learning than they are today. And I, I'm fully convinced, I, fir I firmly believe that we should familiarize ourselves with this excellent tool and use it. And to make sure, as you can see in the slide now, that what we teach is reflective of real language in use. And we needn't be afraid of this, because uh, I've heard teachers saying, yeah, but it's so different, sometimes it's so different, and it defies what I teach. But then, yeah, we, we have to bring real language into our classrooms. At least this is what I believe. And we can create a lot of motivating classroom activities. And again, it doesn't take a lot of planning or preparation. The examples that I've shown, uh, I've shown only two, so the missing word, that only takes a couple of, yeah, you have to uh, log in to the corpus and do some, uh, well, I took some screen grabs, one to the left, one to the right, and I left out the uh, word. And with the other activity, the memory game, all I had to do was print out the search results. So it doesn't take a lot of time to plan and prepare, and, but it's a motivating classroom activity that you can do. Um, corpora can also be used to enhance our own and our students' linguistic understanding. And we can create uh, investigative activities, homework activities. For instance, ask our students, yeah, I noticed that you could seem to keep confusing economic and economical, or historic and historical. Go to the corpus and find out which words collocate with these. And I believe this fits in with what, what we call in, in the curricula in, in Flanders, onderzoekskompetenties, so the research uh, competencies. And it's a, a brilliant way to promote learner autonomy yeah. and exploratory learning, data-driven learning. All these are, are buzzwords I know in uh, methodology, but I, I strongly believe in learner autonomy and in uh, learning from data. So what I wanted to show is that you needn't be afraid of uh, statistics and uh, uh, numbers and uh, figures and such, uh, you, you can do as teachers small scale research and create interesting and engaging classroom activities. Okay, now I'm waiting for uh, any questions you might have. Uh, Ailey says, more glossaries than corpus. Um, then I'm wondering which glossaries Ailey is uh, using. I know that a lot of dictionaries include lists of words that are common. Uh, John asked, using the Oxford Text Checker, how can you determine if a text is too difficult for a level? 
Is there a set of guidelines that you use? Yeah, well, if you click, so what you get is they distinguish. I should actually uh, go back to the, um, what you can learn from the Oxford text checker, text checker rather, is if a text is lower intermediate, upper intermediate or advanced, depending on the number of words that are actu actually occurring there. Yeah, that is a glossary probably of the 3,000 most common words in, uh, in English. And Ellie uh, says, just wondering if readabilityscore.com compares with Oxford Text Checker, pros and cons. To be honest, uh, I don't know. I, I don't know about the readabilityscore.com uh, uh, website. So to be honest, uh, I don't know. Are there any more questions? Nika, I'm afraid I can't hear you. Yeah, yeah, now I hear. Can you hear me? Yeah, now I can hear you. Yeah. There is another question of Margaret. Um, I can't read it completely because. Yeah, to get capabilities beyond uh, frequencies and concordance. Uh, could you explain a bit more, Margaret? I'm afraid I'm not really with you. Because basically what I use Google is to find out about frequency and concordance. Yeah, the advanced, if you want to use all the capabilities, um, the advice I can give is practice. Practice, practice, practice. Uh, because if you don't, um, you forget about things. Um, and then again, I'm not quite sure. I was speaking as a teacher. I do work at, at a university, as Mika has told you. Uh, but I, today I spoke as a teacher, not really as a, a researcher. Um, and I'm not quite sure if uh, we as teachers should know about all the capabilities. But if you want to know, I should say practice. Go to Poker. Poker has a, a lot of um, interesting tools. It's a, a very powerful corpus, really. And uh, practice and explore the corpus uh, as, as much and as often as, as you can. I'm hoping this, this is an answer to your uh, question. Uh, Amy has a, another question here. I try to make personal glossary for business students using a hard code, but I'm not sure how to make glossaries for students. Yeah. The thing is uh, that business corporate, they exist, uh, all sorts of corporates. Um, they're not really accessible to the general public. Um, so if your institution or university or school or whatever is willing to pay um, for a business focus, that would be great, of course. Uh, the thing is, uh, you also write, I'm not sure how to upload docs, uh, documents from students. That is great if you want to make a learner focus. And what I've sometimes done uh, a couple of times already is actually insert a, a text from a into, for instance, a word and phrase dot info hmm, to see the range of vocabulary that my students have. If all the words belong to the, let's say, 500 most common words of English, 
then you can say that your students do not have a very rich vocabulary. And if you make a learning group, uh, you can actually see the development in the, uh, hopefully, in the progress of your students. It's actually, uh, to some extent, you, you can make your own course. And I've done that before as well. Um, for instance, I actually made a, a corpus. I didn't make it, but, uh, well, I did to some extent. So if you go, for instance, uh, if you try and find uh, scripts from TV series, uh, you can easily find most of them on the internet. And I actually made a corpus based on one of my favorite series, uh, which is Downton Abbey. Um, I believe I downloaded the scripts from uh, seasons one, two, and three. And one of my students asked about the use of quite. Um, it was very interesting to find instances of quite uh, in the scripts of Downton Abbey. So you can also make a, a limited corpus and, and find out about the use of certain words. I'm hoping, Aidy, this is uh, an answer to your question. Get new smart.com articles. Okay, no more questions then? Or is that all? Anybody? I was. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm quite sure that you can find these like gears and automobile in, in coca as well, because as I said, it's a uh, uh, a massive corpus, um, but most, let's say, specialist or, or limited um, corpora are not uh, freely available to the general public, I'm afraid. Okay. All the links will be on Facebook, that's great, because I, I've learned myself, actually, which is great. All right, thank you. All right, no more questions for you, then? Well, but I think I have to say thank you very much. You know, that was a great webinar. I think a lot of very, very interesting websites and links were shared. Um, I'm sure Jane said he's going to put them all on uh, Facebook page of Delta, so you can find them there. And of course, people who are members can uh, watch the webinars later on. Everything has been recorded today, so you can always watch it later on our website. Thank you very much for today, um, for being here, for joining us today, and I hope also especially for the people who are here for the first time. We have a Delta webinar every month. Um, as we have our Delta day in March, in two weeks, the 22nd, there will be a longer period in between. So the first uh, one is again on the 11th of May, the next webinar by Michael Griffin. So please keep an eye on our uh, website uh, where you can find every, uh, all information about that. Thank you very much for attending and we hope to see you again at a future webinar. Thank you. I will stop the recording now. Bye.